Hey everyone, I'm Daniel, part of Arendao, here with Edwin Jensen and some of the, the rest of the crew. Um, Edwin has kindly accepted to, to share a little bit about the TLOS. Uh, so maybe Edwin, if you'd like to share a few words about yourself and how the TLOS came to be and what it is, um, we'll get going. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited. Um, I joined Arendao, I guess, a week ago, exactly. And uh, it's, been, it's been fun already engaging with a few different people. And I'm really excited to, to talk about this. Um, so yeah, Edwin Jansen. I like to introduce myself to crowds like you as a, as a recovering manager. Um, I, I was a manager for a long time um, in the tech world. And um, we, like many people, when I read Reinventing Organizations, I think that was seven or eight years ago, um, it completely changed my paradigm um, for how we could be more successful um, as organizations. I realized that all of the things that I was trying to do to engage people and um, you know, do great, meaningful work together were limited by the fact that I had this weird power um, and authority. And so um, at the time when, when I found Reinventing Organizations, uh, I was incubating a startup within the company that I work for, which is uh, called the Ian Martin Group. Um, we're, about, we're a 63-year-old third-generation uh, family business. And um, about 15 years ago, the... Um, the grandson of the original, you know, co-founder um, essentially inherited the business and he, but he's a software developer, not a staffing guy. And so he immediately um, made moves to turn the company into a B Corp. So anyone who's not familiar with what a B Corp is, the B stands for benefit. And so companies like Ben and Jerry's and Patagonia and Warby Parker are B Corp. So it's essentially the certification for a social enterprise. So we move from being a very traditional, you know, profit driven staffing company to becoming a purpose first uh, social enterprise. And you actually, as a B Corp, need to write purpose and various stakeholder benefits into your governance, into your legal framework as a company. And so I started working for this company uh, 10 years ago, and I was hired to invent new businesses that were mission driven and our purpose is to connect people in meaningful work. And there's lots of barriers out there for why people don't find meaningful work. So I've, I've had my hands full. So uh, going back to reading Reinventing Organizations, at the time I was incubating a startup called uh, Fitzy for the, for the company. And we were, I think eight people at the time, we read this book and we were really inspired by it. Um, there was only two managers, myself and my, my favorite colleague, Luth Iglesias. And uh, we said, let's just try this, you know? And so we stripped ourselves of our managerial authority. Um, we had a party, I, actually we did it on Valentine's day. So we called it Valentine's day. And then we spent the next couple of years reinventing all of the practices that required a manager to do something. So hiring, firing, budget approvals, compensation. And we just took our time and we slowly reinvented all of those practices. And, uh, and then over time, the rest of the company started taking notice and started, these practices started seeping into the rest of the company. And, and then I think it was about, I think it's about three years ago that um, the company essentially, there was an, enough of these practices had seeped through. So the company actually kind of had a referendum and the managers officially gave up their power and the rest of the company as well. And uh, so now we're nearly 500 people um, around the world. We're, uh, we're in Canada, in the US, um, that's where our, our customers are, but then our recruiting is often offshore like, in India, the Philippines, Ghana, uh, Peru. Uh, and so this has been a real um, magical experience for everyone. And it's interesting in the teal world, there's, or sorry, not in the non-teal world, there's often questions. Well, 
yeah, this sounds like it's great for people, but is it actually more successful? Is it actually more productive? Uh, does it make business sense? And we've got an interesting story to share. Uh, when the pandemic happened, you know, two years ago, as you can imagine, being in recruiting, our um, job orders were immediately down by like 70%. I mean, no one was hiring. Everyone was doing layoffs and salary freezes, right? Um, the rest of our industry went through a contraction almost immediately. They, they did layoffs and, and salary freezes reductions themselves. Uh, at our company, you can't be laid off. You, you, things can't happen to you. So we essentially moved very quickly to, um, um, to name a new what we call a thematic goal, which is a Patrick Lencioni um, tool that answers the question, what is most important right now? And so we quickly shifted our thematic goal and we did this collectively through, you know, through using Lumio, our collective decision making tool to essentially pivot our company and move away from helping the employers that weren't hiring into employers that were hiring. And if you remember at the beginning of the pandemic, retirement homes, long term care facilities really desperately needed to hire nurses and PSW. So we started we had no healthcare experience. We started helping them. Then we started helping. Uh, different government entities with COVID-19 contact tracing. And we started, you know, fully um, staffing all of those teams. Then we moved into vaccine scheduling. And so lo and behold, our industry went through a major contraction. And over the two years, you know, post pandemic, we grew our net income by 650%, which is astounding <laughs> and when we did a retro on this like wow what happened the teal operating system was the most cited reason as to how we could have possibly performed so well in that environment so what is the teal operating system that's the link that we've shared here uh, teal.ianmartin.com so if you all go to that this is essentially the framework that we've built together over the years. And if you click on it on the boxes that are kind of popping up for you, you can see the detail of all of the practices. So there's different teal systems, as we know, holacracy, sociocracy. This is our homegrown system. We've shamelessly stole um, all of the different things that we could find from different systems and ideas. And then we've iterated it over time. So what I was thinking today is you're all, I'm sure, enthusiastic and interested about all of these different practices. Um, this is obviously used in a company environment, not in a DAO environment. Um, but yeah, I'm open for business. Whatever questions you have, whatever topics, uh, the juicier the question, the better. I'm more than willing to get vulnerable and tell you all of the mistakes and tears that were shed. <laughs> Uh, in the creation of this thing. So yeah, that's my spiel. Thank, thanks a lot, Edwin. Um, while everyone else maybe takes a look, I have um, uh, a first curiosity I'd love to get started with. And I understand that it's a group, so you have multiple businesses and you're starting new businesses. So could you tell us a little bit about how how does that process work of uh, starting new businesses and especially the funding around these uh, these new businesses and those funding decisions. Yeah, well, that that's that's essentially uh, my core role at the company. Um, so I have the role of of corporate development, fancy way of saying, you know, what is our future strategy? Um, and it's interesting because yesterday I was I was talking to Ted Rao from Sociocracy about this very question. And he was posting on Twitter, like, how do we do strategy in self-managing, you know, organizations? And uh, I can tell you it's the same as in orange and green organizations, but very, very different. It's the same sort of motion, but a very different mindset. So instead of um, me, you know, driving and proposing and like, and really trying to create the strategy, me and, and people like me are sensing into a possible future, repeating that back to people, and then trying to marshal support and interest in making a proposal. 
So if you look at our TL operating system, we essentially have two different types of decisions. Decisions which don't affect people, which don't change their work, don't require behavior change. Uh, and those are advice processes, right? Where you're supposed to consult with subject matter experts and people who are in the know. And then there are consent-based decisions. So making a, an investment proposal, if it's significant, and actually we've decided to make all hiring consent-based because we're, you know, we're a people organization. So the, the biggest spend that we have in aggregate are hires. And um, we also wanna make it clear what internal opportunities there exist. And if there's a job that a person internally could fill that's better than a person externally. So we've chosen to make all hiring consent-based. So we've got a consent to hire. And so if I wanted to make a hire, I would do simply do a consent to hire. If I wanted to, we just made a kind of an acqui hire of I think half a dozen people. And that was also done through Lumio as a proposal. Hey, we're gonna spend a million dollars and here's the business case. And then we've got lots of kind of vigorous you know, debate and questions and, and the decision and the proposal, you know, gets better through a more integrative process like that. Um, yeah. Thank you. Super, super interesting. Would you mind um, perhaps for, for those who might not be familiar with the advisory process uh, to give us a, a, a quick overview of that? And, and then obviously by contrast, the, the difference from these consent sort of proposal based process. Yeah, sure. So the advice process, uh, our, my, my favorite book on this um, is called The Decision Maker. I forget who, Dennis Backey, I think. And he was one of the, the companies, uh, which was at the time uh, called AES, which was featured in Reinventing Organizations. The advice process simply is um, kind of anyone can make any decision provided you use the advice process, which is asking people for their advice, either if they're impacted or affected or close to it, or if they're a subject matter expert. So if I want to upgrade my computer uh, and buy a fancy new Mac, then I would ask the advice of the IT people you know, in the company. I might ask the advice of a budget, uh, like someone in finance or, or whatever. You know, Do we have the kind of money for this? I might ask other people that have seen that have fancy Macs, like, is it worth it or whatever? And then um, different companies have different degrees of transparency uh, as to, you know, how you're incorporating your advice and then, you know, making your decision. And then essentially everyone is responsible for and accountable to their decision, right? Um, so, yeah, I could buy this fancy Mac and I say, okay, I'm going to increase my productivity by 10%. And then, you know, I might say, and I'm going to, I'm going to report back in six months, you know, as to how that decision kind of played out. And then we actually use a, a decision-making tool called Lumio, um, which is really easy. Like you basically create a thread and then you ask for your advice, you get all this advice, then you turn your thread into a proposal, which someone can either say, I consent to, if it's a consent-based process, or they can say, I block this, I object to this, thumbs down. And then at our company, if you object, you are implicated in helping the person to overcome the objection. So you're saying, hey, I think, you know, whatever, it's not worth it buying the high end Mac. I think you should, um, you know, get a refurbished one or whatever. And then we work together on on fixing the proposal. So the person can't just object and then bail, basically. Right, thank you. And, and so you're using uh, both Lumio and these threads, both for the advisory and the consent uh, Correct. processes. Yeah. Right. So, in, in, and in the advisory process, at least the, the version I'm, I'm familiar with at the end is the person who started the action, they, they made a decision, right? Like they just get a little bit of, uh, they ask for input for the different people, the advice. And then after that, they're free to make whatever decision they feel is right after having received that. That advice is also like that the way it operates within you just follow after the thread essentially after the people have replied to the thread they go this is my decision at the end yes exactly so if it's an advice process you don't need consent you just need to collect advice and you know we encourage you to be transparent here's what i'm going to do you know so that you know you can be held accountable or responsible for that decision um yeah so it's either an advice process 
you, you have to get advice. You don't have to listen. I mean, you got to listen to it all. You don't have to follow it all. It's not a you know democracy. You, you're responsible for your decision. Consent is I need your consent, and consent doesn't necessarily mean agreement. It means um, safe to try. I don't see this as a backward movement. I can live with this, right? Um, so that's another key thing that's kind of challenging to make sure that people understand is that doing this doesn't mean I think this is the best proposal. Doing this means that at a minimum I can live with this. Thank you. Super interesting. I I have a, a bunch more questions, but I don't know if uh, there is someone else who, who would like to jump in and and you have something that you'd like either to to say, to mention, or a question to ask, uh, Pablo. Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, uh, Lumio as uh, one of the tools that you use. Could you go through your um, tech stack, tool stack, on how you make all this work? Is it just Lumio, or you combine it with some other tools? Yeah. Um, so, well, we're a, we're a 63 year old company. Uh, so keep that in mind. And so we do use Microsoft Office and Microsoft Teams as our primary, you know, communication. Uh, so that's part of, unfortunately, from my point of view, part of our tech stack. Um, and then I mentioned Lumio. Um, and we're right now in the process of, of uh, evaluating and hopefully, well, actually we're testing and growing our use of a teal org tool called Nestor. Actually, I know Yoast from Nestor is in our endow. Um, so that, that's a tool that we use. We, we're actually testing Sobol. I know you guys are looking at Sobol. Um, I know Brian from Sobol really, really well. I think that's a fantastic tool. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's very important to have some kind of a, what I would call teal org tool, because the biggest challenge is, and I think it, this is probably a challenge for DAOs as well, is people come in and they're like, WTF, who does what? <laughs> How does this work? What are teams are where? And I'm sorry, maybe I'm Discord illiterate, but I cannot make sense out of Discord. Um, you know, it's it's hard, it's, it's difficult. So I think that's a key, key tool to have. Um, and then I shared with you guys already our, our teal.ianmartin.com, that, that's our teal operating system. So that's essentially our governance uh, detail. Like that's how to get work done. And so we're constantly updating that. And we actually have decided that all what we call common practices, so everything that you see in that teal OS are a common practice. They all need to be consented to by everyone. Uh, not necessarily by everyone, but anyone who anyone can consent to it. So I was just recently stewarding an update to our role advice process. Got lots of advice, came back, did a proposal in Lumio, got even more advice, and then said, okay, you know, so whenever we're, we're upgrading kind of to a version two or a version three of a practice, we're getting everyone's consent um, to do that. So that's definitely a best, best practice. Um, and then like, like, you know, I don't know if you guys have looked at murmur, it's it, they're still in kind of stealth mode, but, um, you know, I, I think that those sorts of tools where you can on the fly, um, iterate on the agreements that you have about how you're going to do work together. That's a really critical tool that I see missing in many DAOs and would just make life easier for everyone. Thank you. Uh, we have Elahe who's asking the decision making process consent is anonymous or not? Um, no, not, nothing is, or very little is anonymous at our company because, you know, we're all employees and all of that. It's a kind of a different paradigm. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, do, do you have the budgeting processes? Are those sort of on, on a rolling basis for the consent process or do you have some sort of like cohort or cyclical budgeting where you compare things. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the way you do it and why why is that way or any thoughts that you might have about why not alternatives or so on? Yeah, well, that's that's a that's an area I think that we can improve on. So if you imagine, you know, 63 year old company 
uh, like 10 years ago, five years ago, even we were trying to do the, what I think is kind of a silly thing that companies do, right? Let me predict the future the, as best I can and create a budget, right? And then let's, let's like completely miss the mark and, and, you know, flagellate ourselves um, because we couldn't predict the future. So over the last few years though, our, our CFO and the, and, and the finance team have been really attempting to do rolling forecasts um, and looking into tools like beyond budgeting and those, I think more dynamic uh, financial management systems. Um, I don't think we're there yet. So we still do create an annual budget that um, is just actually at least a few times a year and in some ways kind of dynamically managed, but we just don't have a great cadence of actually formally doing uh, uh, this rolling forecast. So it's kind of a work in, in progress. Does that answer your question, Daniel? Is that what you're getting at? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah I think, it, I, th I think it does. I, I mean, I, I on, I'm kind of, um, so the Abby, I, I know you have a question. I'll go into it in a second. Just uh, before that, to continue a little bit on this thread, is so the process of you, well, you're saying the the budget as a forecast. Um, but then there is also, um, let's say, a funds allocation piece that happens as part of that fo forecast. Let's say like this team will get this budget for their operations and this other team or this other business will get this much. Um, no, no, th thankfully not. Um, so, yeah, that that is something that we used to do and is no longer uh, we're not trying to you know, predict and imagine and allocate in that way. So the budget is more like we have this base business. It go, let's go to all the business units and try to predict as best we can what their revenues and their costs are going to look, look like. And then we manage investments, net new investments, um, via consent processes and proposals as we're going along. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so the, actually, sorry, one, one more question on, on this thread. So the, let's say the, the profit that every business is making the, the excess, uh, is that going to a central pot that, that then is being managed through the consent process is that any, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And, and is that happening at the, let's say at the umbrella level or at the individual businesses level or both, or is there some sort of like the individual businesses have a common pot or like the, the umbrella level or what would be in a corporate setting more the HQ that cert, a certain amount of budget re, re, stays within the business and certain amount is given as a, to HQ as a sort of tax or contribution to the parent company? We used to do it like that. We don't anymore. It, it basically, you have the kind of um, baseline operating budget that each you know, business signs up for, you know, here's what we're expecting in revenue. Here's what our base of cost, which is mostly headcount costs and salaries. Right. Uh, and then, you know, they're just managing within that. And if they want to do anything extra, they're making all company wide consent proposals for their, their, you know, with their business case, essentially. Um, the other interesting thing we started doing in the last two years, if you can imagine, I mean, we grew our net income 650%. So all of a sudden we had this amazing financial, you know, windfall. Uh, I, the CFO hates when I use the word windfall. Um, but, and, and our owner is, um, you know, he turned the company into a B Corp. He owns a hundred percent of this company, but he doesn't want to, he wants to, and is actively exploring doing ESOPs or turning us into a DAO with tokens. And like, how does he transfer? He wants the employees to own and control the company. T today, they're already managing it. Uh, they should own it. So what he's actually done is um, created a, a profit sharing model. And so he's worked with the CFO and said, what do we as stewards of this company reasonably need to take as retained earnings every year? What percentage or what do we need to to please the bankers and to you know have as our rainy day fund, and then um, how much you know basically the rest of it is being given back to the employees uh, via profit sharing. 
So like I made more money last year than I've ever made uh, in my career um, because of the profit sharing. So um, yeah, just, just, just to, we're kind of already working as if we were owners of the company and receiving the benefits via profit sharing without actually having to buy the company from him. Um, so it's incredibly generous um, how he's done it. Fantastic, thank you. So Abby, Abby was asking, how do you create the psychological safety where non-anonymous decisions can feel comfortable for the group? Love this question. Thank you for that, Abby. Psych safety is so critical. It is it is the foundational thing, or one of the foundational things for the TL operating system to be successful. And so uh, it's not one thing that we do to create psychological safety. Um, it's it's a thousand things. And, but it all starts with being, you know, incredibly mindful of um, of of what creates and takes away from psychological safety. Um, we've spent, I, I think, mo the most amount of time in what I call the lifeblood of the TLOS on our feedback practice, and so we use a particular model from a little book called Feedback That Works. And they talk about the SBI model, situation, behavior, impact. And then we added um, TIR, um, how you receive the feedback. T, thank you. This is a gift. I, let me inquire so I can deeply understand it. And then R, repeat and record. Okay, Daniel, you know, I'm going to repeat to you. This is what I'm hearing. Did I get that right? And then we've actually tried to gamify it. Okay, now I got to go into one of our tools and go hashtag TIR, thank you, Daniel, for the feedback. Um, so that, and then we can track that Daniel, you know, gave me the gift of feedback. Um, just to mention about SBI and why I think it's it's worked so well for us. Um, it's it's really it's it's a way for people when they're emotionally triggered and could give feedback in such a way that it might decrease psychological safety, it kind of forces them to package it in a container that has good chances of landing in a healthy way right so it's you know it's as you can imagine situations so let's say daniel gives me feedback edwin situation was in this google meet right behavior was um whatever i i used a word that 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 triggered daniel and that made him feel whatever uh, bad in some way the impact is impact on daniel so he can't say, and I saw that Paulo was grimacing, and I think Paulo was really offended. He can't, that's, that's secondhand feedback. That's up to, to Paulo to give me. And so Daniel is saying, okay, Edwin, you made me feel bad. And I'm telling you this because my belief is your intention wasn't to make me feel bad. So I'm sharing this with you so that we can be closer together, not as a blame, you know, whatever. And then so I say, oh, wow, thank you, Daniel, because it's really hard to give feedback like that. And how can I know, like, I don't want to offend you. Oh, my God, like, thank you for that. Now, let me understand. Was it this? Was it that? Have I done this before? How could I have said it differently so that I wouldn't have offended you? That's the I. That's the inquire, right? And then I repeat back and I say, okay, Daniel, I use this word. And really, if I would have used this word, it would have been better. And here's my commitment to going forward. What do you think? And then Daniel's like, holy shit, amazing. Now we're blood brothers, right? So the key uh, for psychological safety, in my opinion, is helping people to better communicate. Um, what's interesting is I'm, so we have a conflict resolution practice that we actually call our facilitation practice. And I'm a, I'm a trained facilitator in that practice. We changed the name from the resolution practice to facilitation because people think that they're in conflict when they're not there's not actually a conflict there is a miscommunication a misunderstanding there's some hurt feelings there's some triggering so to me psychological safety is all about better communicating with each other giving each other the benefit of the doubt coming from a place of love and not fear and when we see fear and we see scarcity and we see hurt feelings, how do we shine a light on that and help people? Um, so anyway, that was a long monologue, long answer to your question there, Abby, but you can tell I'm passionate about it. 
It's great. Thank you. Hmm. So, when, oh, Paolo, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, please go. I'll uh, go. Yeah, but maybe just to um, go deeper on this topic. Um, um, how often do you think, uh, just an estimate, how often do you think you have to facilitate uh, moments like that where people uh, have conflicts or, um, or uh, um, there's some misunderstanding or hurt feelings and, and so on? In a 500-person uh, organization, how often does it happen? Uh, we, we don't track it. I think we have about 15 trained facilitators. Um, and people, I wish they were good about this, but aren't very good about doing the hashtag TIR, thanks for the feedback. So we really don't know. All I could say is my, my guess is that maybe thinking from a person point of view, that at least once a month, if not more, you have a conversation with someone that doesn't go as well as it could have. And that sticks with you. That triggered you in some way, you know, that's giving you some story about whatever that person and your relationship. Um, at least once a month, if not once a week, if not for some people once a day, you know, and the longer that it goes without the SBI TIR, often the worse it gets. So um, just last week, I had to do a group facilitation between two departments, our sales team and essentially like our customer success team. And there were 25 people or something in this meeting and four months of miscommunication and hurt feelings. And just like, it was really tense, super tense. And the most fascinating thing, at least for me, is the whole problem that everyone was all hot and bothered about and literally like people using the word furious, you know, and people thinking that, oh my God, I might get fired for this, even though you can't get fired at our company, you know? Um, it, it's like, we're not curing cancer. It's like, how do we serve our, cut when our customer asks us a question, do we, do we have dedicated reps that answer it or do we have a group of pool that answer questions? Like literally like that's what they were all crazy about. So I'm, I was trying to explain to people, if we can communicate well with each other, we can solve any of these problems. The only problem that we have is, you know, one group said you guys did made this mistake and then they were blame, 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 angry. And then the other group was like, you know, freeze and scared and defensive. Right. So I, I think this is I call this the final frontier in Teal. We've spent all of our time on governance. And it's like the, we, the practices are fine. The practices are not the problem. It's how do we help people communicate with each other? That, that resonates a lot. I was having uh, a very random interaction on, on Twitter uh, a couple of days ago where I made some comment about DAOs and, and someone reply with something about how they completely disagreed. And after a few interactions, we ended up realizing that they were talking about DAOs and an enzyme that has something to do with epigenetics. <sighs> and, and anyway, we kind of ha had a laugh, but very quickly the conversation turned at how, uh, how rare it is to have a disagreement in one of these online platforms that then turns into a laugh and, and some understanding. And I mean, this was, it was, it was, the conversation was so random that I guess it wasn't triggering for us, but uh, with my partner who's a um, relationship coach, she often mentions that the, the things that trigger us are those that affect our, our identity. That is when, when the story, the narrative that we have about ourselves gets, mm -hmm. um, yeah, something contradicts that, that that's especially in a public setting, 
if we feel it, our status as an expert or a good person in this way uh, that is challenging. So I can definitely I can definitely see that being a huge issue. And in and in DAOs where people are coming in and out all the time, um, I guess it can be a big challenge. So I'm I'm very curious because one one thing I I noticed, for example, with Aaron Dow, as it has developed, is at the beginning, it was relatively simple. And now there is a lot more going on. And the people coming in now, they have to face all of that complexity. And there is people coming in and in and out all the time. Uh, so I know that uh, in your situation, it's a little bit different. But still, the the operating system that you guys have developed uh, for Teal is, is quite comprehensive. And, and there is a lot of practices there and quite a few mindset changes. So I'm, I'm very curious how your sort of recruitment onboarding process works with that. And if you could tell us a little bit of how, how does it work to, in, to bring people into these, uh, well, what is probably a very different culture from many others mm. they have worked in in the past. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I wrote, I wrote an article about, about this and what I've noticed um, on Medium um it's like something like how how people really adopt teal um and the um me the analogy that i use uh, or the i don't know the metaphor or analogy i don't know is that um it's head heart habit so first i can't we can't kind of hire you in good good conscience um if you don't understand intellectually in your head that this is a different paradigm that the teal paradigm is different than um, what you're likely coming from and so we give people the books and the articles and we talk their ear off so that they can understand this is not incrementally different this is completely different um uh, like the work is 90 percent the same but the paradigm the container is very different and so in our recruitment you know process we we you know we we explain all this stuff and essentially the person needs to say i get it i understand it and i like it i want to try it i i think that this should be better than what i'm coming from so that's kind of the intellectual the head understanding then you get into what i call the messy middle which is the heart and the emotional phase of the adoption. And everyone goes through this that I have seen, everyone. Because the systems that we're coming from, you have to protect yourself because the company's goals are not the same as yours, right? There's many times when you have to defend yourself and protect yourself and take care of yourself. The company doesn't actually take care of you. And so, so you're in this teal system and something happens to you, you get some tough feedback or you're in an actual conflict, conflict with someone and you get scared, you get fear triggered. And so the places that you were, if you were traumatized and where you came from, that's triggered. You're like, oh shit, this is happening again. Okay, I got to protect myself. And you start defending, blaming, you know, Daniel gives me some feedback that triggers, like you said, Daniel, like this... The, the thing that I'm most afraid of about myself or the thing that I don't want to be true about myself, right? And then I'm like, no, man, Daniel, you're wrong and you're bad. You must be out to get me, whatever. And then what I like to say is, you know, around here, personal development is a team sport, you know? So Daniel gives me some like valid feedback about how I offended him. And what I hear is not that he cares about our relationships and so he's telling me what i hear is that you're telling me i'm a jerk and i'm not a jerk right daniel must be out to get me he and he talked to katarina about this so they they're like colluding to you know and then daniel and paulo and katarina come get around me and they're like edwin we love you we we think you're you're great and Sometimes you th say things that offend us. And we think you can be a better version of yourself if you know that and you try to not say those things that offend us. And some people realize, you know what? 
I have nothing to be afraid of here. Let me take that feedback and be a better version because these three people care about me. And some people are like, screw you guys. <laughs> and I'm out of here. Or this is not true or some, some story, right? So that's the heart phase, which is an adoption of the paradigm that this truly is an ecosystem that we're where love that like that loves you and wants you to be the best version of yourself right and not the other paradigm story which is i have to protect myself and people are out to get me or the company is against me right and then kind of once you're through that and you, know, you still get triggered i mean i get emotionally triggered from time to time i get into that place but once you're mostly through that then you're into the third level which is habit habit change I used to show up at meetings and acted like this, but now in this paradigm, I'm showing, I'm practicing showing up like this, right? And then it's it's changing those habits that we formed um, in our previous working lives. Hmm. Um, thank you so much. Uh, two two follow up questions, but um, first um, I'll, I'll I'll ask one, then I'll pass to Oliver, and then maybe I'll ask the other one after. So just a quick clarification, as you're going through these uh, initial phases of the, the head, the heart, uh, and then the, the practice, the, do you have some sort of, I guess, schooling, academy training? Uh, how, how, does that, how, does, how does that work? Like, how is this, this process held? Yeah, so... Um in your first three months you get assigned a sponsor a teal sponsor that you're meeting with regularly and that's just helping you to practice the practices practice giving feedback practice receiving feedback go out and give it right um realizing like it's your responsibility to give feedback it's a problem or an opportunity if you see it so you know if 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 our if our ceo gives tries to give a motivational speech and it demotivates you you are responsible for giving the ceo feedback hey i think you were trying to motivate us but when you said this that actually demotivated me and like that sounds crazy to people right and so the sponsor is there to say like okay what have you noticed what that could be better uh, have you had any interactions with people that didn't you know that weren't great they share one okay great awesome let's you know, write it out sbi okay you're gonna go and give it how did that go you know so over three months that sponsor is like you know encouraging you to adopt the practices and then um at, at the end of the three month period you graduate you either graduate or you don't um basically and that sponsor is responsible for making that decision, um, whether you whether you graduate. Um, and then we have a really beautiful like two three hour meeting with the people that you've worked most closely, and we do a retro of what you've learned and how you've grown and how we can continue to support your success um, because it's not done at three months. You're still just you're like you're not through the heart phase for sure um, at, at three months. So yeah, that's that's what we do. And then the other thing is all of our most intense practices, the role advice practice, the contribution review, the compensation advice uh, process, um, uh, and then facilitation, they involve what we call um, a peer mentor. So when you're going to go and change your comp, you pick a, a peer mentor to help you with all the head trash that you're going to get. Like when Paulo comes in and is like, Edwin, you're great, but like you are not worth a million dollars and here's why. Right. You know, so then I can call my peer mentor and be like, okay, uh, how do I make sense of this? So we make sure that you have buddies. Um, like I'm a facilitator and I've needed facilitators to come and help me when I'm, you know, going crazy about something. Thank you. That's super, super insightful. Uh, Oliver and then Ray has a question that I'll, I'll ask. 
Thanks, Daniel. And, and thanks, Edwin. No, exciting topic. Um, maybe just a quick parenthesis. I'm, I'm really exploring and deep diving into this rabbit hole. And Teal, of course, is something self-organized um, organizations or collegial leadership and all that. And now connecting it with, you know, blockchain and the DAO movement, I feel there's tremendous potential in that. Um, what I felt you were already a little bit touching on was I wanted to know first off, and I had a second question, if I may, on average, and I know everyone is different, but these three phases that you described, how long does that take? And like, what is a good, you know, kind of rule of thumb for when should you have know. been through it? I don't, I, I have, I don't know, man, honestly. <laughs> um, I'm just happy we're talking about it. Uh, and because like how like I certainly obviously haven't done any kind of a study around this and this is just my weird idea it might not even be true or accurate I don't know um but I would say that the heart phase like so we have some leaders senior leaders in our organization that in my opinion still are not through the heart phase after five years yeah and so what i'm working on right now and you know you guys are all i guess teal nerds and nerds about this kind of stuff maybe you can help me i believe that there there are some beliefs behind the teal operating system and my definition of a belief is something that I believe to be true, but someone else could believe the opposite to be true. And, and neither of us is right. You know, it's almost like a faith-based thing. So for instance, like, you know, you've got a, a belief that uh, something that Aaron Dignan talked about in, in his book, Brave New Work, that you're people positive. I believe that people are creative and resourceful and dedicated and trustworthy generally. Or you might have a distrustful belief. I believe people, in order to get the best out of people, you need to manage them and, you know, trust but verify or whatever. So that's an example, right? You can have a belief in the value of radical transparency versus, you know, being careful with your information. So something that I think I have, a, I have an inkling that could be valuable is to somehow codify what are all these beliefs and then help people to look at those beliefs and say, do I believe that or not? Because if I don't, I'm going to be miserable here and I'm going to make other people miserable. And so the, the, the thing that we, I think where we, where we've gone wrong most as an organization is that senior leaders who essentially need to see the value for them and everyone else in giving up power. They need to want to give up power because they believe it's better. But their whole jobs previous were, it's better for everyone if I'm responsible for the whole team because I'm smart and capable and all of this stuff, right? And because those people can't take responsibility for the whole thing like I can. So it's like a dismantling of the whole belief and but then you're like okay but wait if i'm not responsible for everyone and everything then what am i good for what am i what's my use right and i just and at our organization we haven't that's a really scary hard thing i went through this thing and we have not helped powerful people to work through that in a healthy supportive way um that that's been a blind spot for us in my opinion uh, Oliver, wow. if, if that's okay, I'm going to uh, follow with Ray's question. Uh, Please go. Yeah. So, Thank you so much, Edwin. Yeah. I, and then there is one by Abby, just to rotate it a bit. Uh, I'm not sure, Abby, we'll get to yours, but uh, at least hopefully we can do Ray's. And he says, as we talk about triggers, I'm curious if there is a perspective on lived trauma and how it might be harder for some folk to feel safe and regulated than others. Is there a perspective on if the organization has a responsibility to help folk work through these triggers? Like when you're leaving the organization, like, I don't know if I follow leave trauma. What is that? Uh, lived. Lived. Experience. Yeah, it's experienced trauma. Oh. Sorry, that's my pronunciation. <laughs> 
Um, I'm bring, I'm going to get feedback on that from Daniel. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't totally know if, if I understand what you're asking, but what's coming up for me, or at least what I've noticed, is that everyone has work trauma um, from the past, right, or from school even, and these things are often triggered. And something that I spend a lot of time doing as a facilitator when someone is triggered or when two people are in conflict or miscommunicating is separating the facts that you would both agree on what happened, who said what, what happened, and the story that you're telling yourself about why that happened, what the meaning is, what that person intended, what that's going to mean for the future. And what I've noticed is that human beings are meaning making machines, right? We're constantly inventing meaning. But if we don't find ways to share that meaning with each other in healthy ways, then we can, we can do this, right? Um, and make it worse for ourselves. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I've, I've spent a lot of my time in helping people to understand their trauma and understand how their trauma is is can potentially be processed in a healthy way through a, through, through a situation and sometimes it just hurts too much and, and someone can't go there or do it thank you so much this has been super insightful um there is a few a few more questions that were around oliver i know you had one katarina as well uh unfortunately or or time is up uh, but I would encourage everyone I shared uh, a couple of links, follow the, the Twitter, and there is a link there to see the other events that we have. And the, the great news is that Edwin is not going anywhere. Uh, obviously, he, his time is, is, is he, he might have other priorities as well, uh, but he's in the Arendal server, and you're welcome to ask him for him to decide if he wants to respond, but you're welcome to ask and continue the conversation in the learning and discussion channel. Uh, we can start a thread there and and keep this conversation around Teal and DAOs alive because, uh, as Oliver was saying earlier, uh, there is probably a tremendous potential there to, to explore this intersection and to use this DAO movement to help catalyze this wave of progressive organizations. So thank you all, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Edwin, for, for sharing uh, all of these insights from, from your experience and the, the amazing work that you guys have been doing. Um, very appreciated. And see yep. you all very soon. Thanks for having me. My door's open. I love talking about this stuff, so don't be shy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Have thank a good you. weekend. See you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.